Her world is surreally beautiful and at times full of danger. Blue sheets hung as curtains, a wasp lurking beneath a spoon, or even a saint navigating the state routes of Michigan behind the wheel of a thunderbird are not uncommon occurrences in Mary Bittinger poems. Her poems have appeared in a number of literary journals, including Copper Nickel, Diode, Gulf Coast, and Passages North, among others. She's the author of Prairie Fever and the forthcoming chapbook, St. Monica. <laughs> Apart from her talent in poetry, Mary Bittinger has also acted as editor for the Akron series in poetry, as well as the independent literary annual, Barn Owl Review. In addition to being the current director of the Northeast Ohio Master of Fine Arts program, she has also instructed writing classes for a number of years. I can personally say that she is equally talented in her ability to teach as she is in her ability to create amazing works of art. It is an honor for me to welcome Mary Vinegar. Um, the first poem I'm going to read is called Wrong Things Done So Right. The men in my town made their own wood out of gunpowder. Bones were the wood. I was the bone they most wanted to string. Disobedience was expected, so we excelled at being the wood. Mine Brazilian cherry, or a fine replica. Someone watched a show about unnatural habitats. The bone did not watch anyone for long. A hawk descended upon a piece of wood in the river, thinking it was a muskrat, or somebody's thigh bone. I knew it was only an old buckshot pheasant, pretended it was an ancient book in vellum. The television blurred into a commercial. A man next door hacked something in two. What it was didn't matter. We were all still bone and waiting for the right sort of rope. And so this is a poem in which um, I let myself brag a little bit about my voting skills. We had to actually get a voting license to graduate from high school. It was that hardcore. There is nothing left to keep you afloat. My pockets were always good pockets and empty of the things that would condemn me. When I ran the streets, it was with purpose. I was never afraid of the ball, even when it came smashing through my windshield on the freeway. It wasn't a ball. It was my neighbor's head, and there was no car, just a canoe on its side. You can't paddle it that way. They called me the queen of portage, stood me at the edge of the dock and said, go permitted 30 seconds for a full contemplation before go. Only tied cinder blocks on when I deserved them. Everyone knew how much I fancied a challenge. We had no mountain to go tell it on. Instead, just acre upon acre of dead barns and their wet thighs. My mother cut the pockets out of my pants, shut the seams with glue. We spoke of this no more. The fish you save may be your own. My mother was the one who burned down the barn, baked ball bearings into a crumb cake. Burglars dumped their stolen televisions on our front porch. One morning, there were nine piled up like blocks. I wanted to live in a fish shanty year round and did, minus the ice. Sometimes it was wet. Certain nights, my mother dropped lanterns into the hole where I slept. At Woolworths downtown, a tragic scenario. All the candy jars imploded at midnight. I punched a crater in the kitchen wall and a charm bracelet slithered behind the stove. Or was it an avalanche of nonpareils, a string of fish left to starve to bone? The next day, all that was left was one horseshoe. Nobody bothered to muck the stalls again. I chose the most shimmery rainbow trout in the bucket. We added a pinch of cut glass for good measure. Okay, this is called St. Monica of the Gauze. <coughs> the room is red with iodine. Her ears stop and her thighs slacken against the bed. The owls would like to unwrap her, as owls do, always looking for the next loose shutter, the goldfish bathing in a pile of spilled parmesan in the convenience store parking lot. She explains a few things. Static racks the telephone line, a dry tornado on the helipad after a freeway crash. The linoleum has seen years of other feet and beds rolling in and out, how they hauled her from the gurney as if she weighed something other than what was left. They ask, 
But what about your Cleveland flowering pear trees? Or the creeping vinca, the clematis your husband promised to burn if it came back? They say that she will get out. There will be time and muscle enough for hanging wet towels on a line. This is called St. Monica Gives It Up. <laughs> they say chastity is a gift, like an extra thumb. But they have never seen Kevin McMillan bare to the waist in an apple tree, as Monica did one Wednesday afternoon before dance class. The bun in her hair nearly unraveled itself. All of the birds around her dipped to the ground in search of stray fire ants. Still, she clung to her St. Christopher medal, taped up more kitten posters in her school locker, pounded the bread dough a little bit harder. Twenty years later now, and she still sees him, grinding cross sections of a fallen oak, or staggering across a field to her in pink moments before the alarm clocks blare. St. Monica takes communion twice. The first time it was the girl with hair tucked behind her ears. The second time it was the girl with hair in her face, hands unfolded, bra strap peeking out from the neckline of her sweater. She just got back in line and did it all over again. The funny thing was that nobody even noticed, as if those same Cordovan hush puppies hadn't just passed the altar and scuffed the floor in front of the choir, leaving a flesh-colored ribbon of rubber. Was she really that anonymous? When Monica reached the rear of the church, she stepped back into line for the long walk down the aisle, like a widow ready to do it all over again and hoping there would be more sex this time. Monica didn't feel any more satisfied. Each trip was separate to her and unrelated. Nobody dared her to do it. Years later, the girl with hair tucked behind her ears would be taking notes on Shakespeare's sonnet number 144, while the girl with hair in her face stared behind the hair at Kevin McMillan, then ditched at break and spent the second half of class in the janitor's closet with dreadlocked mops and ghosty bottles of ammonia, Kevin McMillan half naked in front of her, the two of them blowing cigarette smoke out the ventilation grate and drinking water from a rubber hose. The girl with hair tucked behind her ears took two or three showers a day. Her boyfriend, Jason, took four and shaved twice, even though he didn't need to. They went on dates to museums of natural history and daylily farms, or spent weekends carving pumpkins and swimming laps for diabetes research. Monica and Jason had a collective dream involving a golden retriever named Pfeffernus and a silver Volkswagen hatchback. The girl with hair tucked behind her ears called into work with strep throat and everyone signed a card for her. The girl with the hair in her face left a voicemail at 4.26 a.m., something about a lost filling or a flat tire, and spent the entire day chain smoking in Kevin McMillan's childhood bedroom where he moved after flunking out and getting divorced. His parents still had his engraved wedding clock on their mantelpiece. The girl with hair in her face remembered this detail while clutching the mahogany headboard of his parents' bed as he nailed her from behind, or when she slipped off his mother's cantaloupe silk nightgown and folded it back into the nightstand drawer. The girl with hair behind her ears slept in final boxers and a hard rock cafe sweatshirt. Would both girls meet somewhere in the future, standing next to each other in a Denny's bathroom? The girl with the hair in her face showing up for a job interview, still smelling like Captain Morgan's, in lint ruled yoga pants, only to be ex escorted to the office of the girl with the hair tucked behind her ears, cross and judgmental, revving the paper shredder. Both girls might land parts as extras in films, but then kaboom, they'd be discovered by the same director at the same time and drafted to star opposite each other in a miniseries. Or it could be some Sunday in ordinary time. The Eucharistic minister with hair tucked behind her ears, the Monica with hair in her face, taking that long walk down the aisle, destined to turn around and do it all over again. 